So uh, thank you. Well, thanks all for coming. Thanks for inviting me. And um, I spent, I suppose, a certain amount of my time answering this question. Uh, what sort of internet, internet do I want? In fact, jumping up and down in front of people who didn't ask the question and telling them <laughs> that, uh, what sort of internet they, uh, they should be fighting for. Uh, Vin uh, and I have occasionally been doing this sort of thing, uh, sometimes on the same stages, uh, and, uh, and, uh, so, and often s s sneaking our opinions about what we feel is, a, uh, is an appropriate internet into talks about other things because people need to know. So it's nice to have, be able to actually address it um, per, uh, as the main topic of the, of the day. So, um, so let, me, let, let me just go back to explain where I'm coming from. Um, yeah, so back in 19, 1989, I was sort of frustrated because I was actually, you know, I, was, I wasn't actually employed to develop the World Wide Web or anything. I was employed, employed to do various software projects but I was doing them with people who worked in different parts of the world and collaborated together. The internet was just recently becoming available and, uh, uh, and usable in, uh, in Europe without people saying, isn't that some American thing? Shouldn't you be using ISO protocols? Um, but everybody saw that it, uh, that it worked. And so the, the, the internet was available. And in fact, so the very common situation was, I'd be sitting there in this very large, you know, this European particle physics lab, large organization, I need some information. I know that that information, I may have a piece of the printed bit on front of me, but I know it's been produced on a computer. I know it's, there's a file somewhere going around on a disk somewhere, and the disk is on a computer, and the computer's on some kind of a network. And these internet people have done a pretty good job of tying these networks together. So in fact, probably, the network connected to the computer that I'm on is connected somehow to that computer, and therefore, in principle, I should be able to find that, that document, but I can't. Maybe I've got some obscure ways of going over the various networks and logging on to a remote computer and then running some program, learning how to run the program and access the data on it. And maybe I'll then just be able to read it, read it on my screen, but, or maybe I'll be able to get it back, but if I do get it back, it won't be. It's almost certainly in a format I can't use. So, the, so as a user, I sat there with this problem. As a user of the internet, I decided that it could be fixed fairly straightforwardly just by imagining that all these documentation systems were in fact part of one imaginary documentation system which uh, existed in a space which I called URL space and that URLs were various different s sorts. We need a new protocol for various reasons. Uh, it was called HTTP, like FTP but different. Uh, but all the FTP things would be part of the space. So it was, so it was, a, it was a question of just imagining this the space, defining the URLs and writing the HTTP protocol spec, which was very simple in, in those days, and defining the lingua franca or HTML. And I just wrote those specs and basically wrote, as I wrote the code, it was so easy in those days. It's no, you have no idea how easy it is to do standards when there's only one of you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so nobody breathing down my neck at all. In fact, nobody really uh, giving me permission to do it apart from one guy who said, go ahead and do it. And so when I did that, then I could set the server running on one machine and go to any other machine, catch the internet, run my uh, browser program and type in the URL, and the browser would go out onto the network. It would use the domain name system, which existed for, uh, had existed for a long time. Uh, it, it would use, uh, and it would send, it would open TCP, uh, sockets where TCP had invested for, in, in existed for around 20 years before that, thanks to Vint and colleagues. And because Vinton's colleagues, when they made IP and made TCP, made it as a really, really good platform, in other words, a really uh, something which is solid, but it does have it has no opinion about what you build on it, just a flat platform. Because they'd made it a very, very open platform, uh, then I could write those programs without asking Vent, asking anybody involved, that anybody asking anybody who was around 20 years before, or any an organization they put into to, uh, to uh, process afterwards, so, and that is because of the way the internet was designed. So my goal with the web was the same thing, design the web to be an open platform. HTTP doesn't tell you what, anything about how you design a website or what sort of software you've got behind it. Is it a file server? Is it, some, uh, is it, is it a map? Is it something totally, uh, uh, is, is it something which is a completely interactive or all the web pages uh, created just randomly as the, uh, 
by a program or is a huge amount of storage behind them. All these things, all that was completely undefined by the HTTP protocol and so the web is another platform. The reason it's been, the internet has been a great platform for the web and the reason that the web has been a great platform for all kinds of other things have been that they are open, have been that there is nobody centrally controlling what innovations happen uh, and, it's because, and it's because also uh, there haven't been royalties payable. That uh, <clears throat> this was just in the internet days, uh, that was, it was kind of assumed. During the web days, people asked the question and the Gopher system, which was another internet-based system, at one point, met, they made the, the University of Minnesota that owned the IPR to the Gopher software at one point said, you know what, not today, but what someday, and not for the client, but maybe for the server, and not for academia, but maybe for industry, we might possibly charge a very small fee. And the moment they said that, everybody, this, the thing had been taking off like this, and it was dropped. People just dropped it because they didn't want to work for the University of Minnesota in their spare time, uh, when it, the people in their garages, and the people and people in the large companies, it became a firing offense, more or less. To, well, basically, once you've read the Gopher code, now you're polluted. Now, Gopher, anybody from the University of Minnesota can claim that anything else you write in the future has actually been inspired by the Gopher software that you, write, you, you read, and so that, that, that you're now a, a legal liability. So getting it royalty-free is really important. So that's a big part of what I think is important about the ongoing uh, internet. And, it's, and it's, in WTC, certainly, we enshrined it uh, when, when so four years after starting the web, it became necessary to start this consortium uh, to deal with the very, very rapid, uh, the need for a very rapid standardization as people very rapidly developed web, uh, web um, uh, technology and web standards. Uh, designed very much after, with a lot of uh, taking a lot of clues out of the IETF book, Internet Engineering Standard, uh, Internet Engineering Task Force. Working group groups are very much a model for WCCs, um, and so, uh, so that, if you like, then is my history. The invention in 1990, uh, WCC. I'm still the director of. It's now. Uh, it, it, it's got. Oh, like the IETF, no shortage of things to discuss. Currently, for example, HTML5 is being, is being discussed. It's just gone to what we call last call in the IETF. There are, uh, sorry, in, the, in uh, WTC. Um, uh, there is the web of data and lots of things which are very, very exciting. And do go to wc.org to find out about them, but it's not what I came to talk to you about today. Um, did I talk to you, uh, uh, came to talk to you today about... Um, what sort of uh, internet we want. And so certainly I want the internet to keep the properties that it had when I uh, made the first web server and uh, first web client and could let them connect. It's very important that it's open to, uh, um, to innovation. Um, it's also, though, it's... Uh, important that it should be open in lots of other ways. And some of these, I mean, originally I suppose the important openness was that seen by geeks. As a geek uh, wanting to invent something, you're interested in, to, in what, who do I have to ask? In fact, I did, I, to get port 80, which is the TCP port, which HTTP uh, uh, runs on, I did have to ask somebody, but it was pretty happy running with port 2784, which was the one you didn't have to ask permission for. 2784 was my parents' phone number. Um, <laughs> 80 is much easier to, to, to uh, happy, very happy to get 80. That was, I thought that was a cool number when I got allocated that one. Um, but in general, uh, the, now it's not just, uh, the, the openness of the internet is not just for geeks inventing things. Geeks inventing things is important, but in fact, now we've got to this stage where the internet is used in such uh, intimate little ways, such uh, the, the, the use of the web as an information space is so ubiquitous when it happens, when people are getting the reaction where when you ask them a question, if they can't remember, they turn to the keyboard or, or the sort of the, the, the drawer of the handheld device to, ooh, I can Google that, uh, is so much built into the way we do things and it's starting to be so much of the way we do business that actually we're getting to the point that we need to preserve the openness because of it's, it's a fundamental property of society. So those things which in this country 
Uh, who, who in the, who's American? Who's a US citizen? Who's not a US citizen? Just want to get the balance. Okay, so in this country, a lot of, some of the things, the property of society, people, you know, people go back to the Constitution, say, well, the founders of the Constitution, they felt that these things were uh, self-evident, some of them. Um, I guess that means they did, felt they couldn't explain why they felt that they were important. Um, <laughs> uh, but they said, look, th look, these are the properties we want of society. That you know, the, 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 the Congress can't go around forbidding this sort of thing. Can't, they can't just put you in jail without telling you why and they, uh, without a trial, and they can't um, stop you uh, talking to people about things. They can't stop you gathering together in groups. Well, now a lot of that translates, on, a lot of that stuff happens on the internet. So when you gather together in a group, it's a group that you found on a web, that you've made on a website. And in fact, so much happens on the web that. It's that if you look at somebody who has got internet access and has access to the web and is actually a participant in the information community, in other words, they're not just uh, using it to watch films, they are maybe blogging, they're may, you know, maybe they're voting, they're, they're actually being, uh, they're using it to do things, they're using it for business, they're using it uh, to, to, for essential social relationships. Uh, then the difference between the capacity, the empowerment of that person and the person who's not got access to that is now huge. So that now we are talking about another dimension to the difference between the haves and the haves and have nots. And I used to think it was sort of arrogant to, to, to talk about, to, to put that up right up there with sort of water and vaccinations and things like that. But now if you actually look at what it, at what it takes to enable somebody in a rural village, allow somebody in, in, a, in a minority to get a job, allow somebody has to stay at home with the kids to be able to get a job, um, then it turns out that, yep, you know, water's important and healthcare is important and you, people are starting to talk about those as sort, of, sort of human rights. Uh, after things like not being imprisoned and so on. But just as not being imprisoned uh, is, is important, actually, if you to take somebody who's, uh, and to take a family and cut it off completely from the internet, the, you know, the, the effect on the teenager's social life will be devastating. The effect on the mom's income may be devastating. The effect on the sa safety of the grandparents who need to have, uh, uh, who need to be able to uh, use some alarm system to, uh, to call for help if they get stuck. There's so many ways. You know, you could, for homework, you can go and make a list of the ways really in which the internet is actually really, really critical in home and play. And there's so many of them that it gets, to, I'm not going to go through listing it. But it gets to the point where now I'm proposing that we should start talking about the right to connect, the right to be part of the information society as a human right. Uh, so I, I say the WTC, uh, we formed in 1994, and it's a standards body, it's an industry uh, group. You can join it as an individual or as a, uh, as a, as a small company or a big company, and it, and it does standards. A little while, <clears throat> just a few couple of years ago, we were looking at the, uh, what this and various other organizations were doing and realizing that what the, the end goal was that the, the web should serve humanity. That was what we ended, were coming up with. That as a, that's the mission statement of all these things we're trying to do, trying to serve humanity. And the moment you look at that, unlike in the early days when there's only a few people using the web and it's all the geeks, now when you look at the web and you realize that 20% of the population of the planet use the World Wide Web, then apart from thinking, well, that's pretty cool, what a lot of people, then whereas you, there's a new question which you didn't ask before, and that is, what about the other 8%? Suddenly, the other 80% is within range. It's within reach. Suddenly, the whole piece of, you say, okay, you want to wonder, so where, where does that 80% come from? And you might think, oh, well, of course, you know, I'm lucky I live in a big city, but uh, there must be 80% of the people who live out there in some jungle. You know, all these people live in the jungle. They don't have any access to internet, do they? Because there's no cell towers out there. Uh, you know, there's, there's no fiber out there. Well, actually, wrong. No, there's only 20% who don't have signal. There are 20% of people in the world where if you were at their home with your phone, you wouldn't be able to make a phone call. So for most people, they've actually got signal. So what's, got, what's wrong? Why aren't they using the web? Uh, is it that they've got a 
signal, but they haven't got a phone? Or is it that they've got a phone, it's the $10 basic Africa brick phone from Nokia, and that doesn't have a web browser on it, because they're waiting for the new one to come around, which hopefully will have a web browser, it'll be really cheap and have a web browser? Or is it that actually they've got a web browser, yeah, but the, what the web, what nobody's actually explained to them what the web thing is, or why it'd be useful? Or is it that somebody did explain to them that it would be useful, and they showed them how to get on. And they did get a phone with a web browser, and they actually found that there wasn't anything useful on it, because actually they don't. You know, the, the native language isn't represented at all. Right, or is it that because the, when they go in on there, they found stuff in the native language, and it's not being translated by well-meaning people or well-meaning well machines, but in fact, it's not live because they didn't realize that it's a read-write place. The web is a read-write medium. Nobody's told them, no, 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 actually, you have to, you don't wait for your, your, your village to appear on Wikipedia, you put it on Wikipedia. You don't wait for it to appear on OpenStreetMap. You put it, and you, when you put your town on the map, that's really useful. It kind of puts your town on the map. When you go to, and if it's not already, you go to OpenStreetMap and you put it on there yourself, and then it'll be a lot easier for people to do business with you. So two years ago, we founded the World, uh, World Web Foundation, uh, and, we, and we've been trying to look at and, and certainly work, and working with, uh, certainly with organ lots of organizations, including ISOC. Um, uh, to look at what we can do. What are, the, what are the, just the few, the smallest, really cool things that we could do for that other 80%, which would say for one large tract of uh, rural Africa, bring people, bring the women who are actually doing the work and doing the farming into, connect, uh, into a situation where they could exchange um, agricultural information about banana blight. Uh, say 10 years earlier than they would otherwise, just in five years instead of 15 years, or maybe in, in two years instead of in eight years. What things could we do? What little examples could we get somebody to set so that the, the mobile phone aware website which they built running from their laptop and the company they built using it, which was based on that website, uh, allowed them to really bootstrap themselves as entrepreneurs and the whole story of that then became the stuff of the oral tradition, the stuff which was, the story which was handed down, the anecdote which was handed down by anybody who wanted to start a business. Oh, you should get yourself a website and make sure it works with phones so that all the people in the villages can, can, can do business with you and make appointments with you and so, uh, and so on. So, um, so, so I've added then on the web for all with the uh, as I've added the web foundation as well. List of organisations I'm involved in. Uh, I've added to the list of my responses to this question that uh, the web should be available to anybody, not to everybody. You don't have to force it, force it to everybody, but. Uh, to put as many people in the possible where they're capable of put, putting themselves in that area. So, that, uh, so there's one more area which I'm going to emphasize before I wrap up, and it, follows also, and it also follows from the fact that, the, that we use the web for so many things. Um, there's the, always been the assumption among everybody in the internet circles that if you get... Uh, can, if you buy connection to the internet at a certain rate for a certain quality of service, you know, you, you, you know, really, really fast most of the time and quite fast some of the time. And I do the same thing. I buy, uh, I, I buy connection to the internet you know, really, really fast most of the time and quite fast some of the time. Then if you've done that and I've done that, then we can communicate no matter where you are uh, really, really fast most of the time and quite fast some of the time. So. Uh, I want to be able to buy lots of different speeds. I want to buy lots of different types of quality of service. I might buy you know, internet, which is uh, actually is deliberately uh, has been cooked up, so it's going to be really good for my Skype conversations, for example. But when I connect to you, we can connect and do whatever we want to do on it. That it's not it's not going to be depending on, uh, for example, if you're if you're a uh, if you're making independent films, uh, maybe you're uh, an expatriate Greek and you're making Greek Greek films, and I'm and I'm another expat Greek in another part of the world, and I just <laughs> it's the end of the day, and I just want to watch some good Greek independent film, 
and I want, and I don't, uh, when I connect, I don't want my internet service provider to say, whoa, hold on, sorry. Yeah, we know you gave you internet access, but we're also your cable company, and like, we give you the movies, and this is your list of movies for tonight. Look at it, it's great, thousands of movies you can watch tonight on cable. Okay, so I'm afraid it's just not that we can't allow you really talk to this guy's movie server because, you know, because that's just, come on, you know, business is business. So, uh, so that sort of, you know, that sort of effect is really, really, is, uh, is one of the really, really, if that were to happen, and every now and again, it almost happens, and, and, uh, and sometimes it happens a little bit. And as it happens, and it, as it starts to happen, then... <laughs> Delete that. <laughs> Sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> you can put it back up. If there's certainly, if there's people who find it easier to follow the, the text in the room, do put it back. Uh, do put it up. Uh, but increase the font size for the people who don't have whose who's, who's, uh, vision is as bad as mine. Um, so. What you don't want to happen is the internet service provider. Because of they, got, they haven't been providing you internet service, they have control over your life. You don't want them telling you, you what, what film to watch. But that actually is only a little wee worry. The, the big worry is uh, that they subtly find ways of steering you towards a particular religion or a particular political party. Okay, so this thing is used for democracy now. Democracy actually really happens largely on the net. Yeah, it happens in other places too, but mainly it happens on the net. If you, can, uh, if you can just make it seem before the election, the one candidate's website uh, is, seems to be rather slow, so that everybody thinks they just didn't spend enough money on getting connected, and so they end up going to the other webs candidate's website because at least you can read it. Or worse, if you can end up, to sort of end up mysteriously redirecting people who were going to a given candidate's website to another one or to a fake one, no, weirder things have happened and been done. You know, uh, if you looked at the Martha Coakley Twitter bombing, uh, the best paper at the Web Science Conference was about uh, how how there was Twitter bombing of the in the Martha, Martha Coakley election. Go check it out. So, control over the uh, over democracy obviously is even much more is, is, is much more insidious and horrible, but also very very lucrative. There's a lot of money, which if it can't be spent on direct campaign. Con con Contributions sure would love to be spent on fixing the internet for a moment just before polling day uh, to, to reflect a different reality. Uh, maybe there'd be a lot of money out there to reflect a different reality when it comes to science, when it comes to um, uh, those people who don't believe the results of science and don't want people to read about evolution. There would maybe, uh, can you imagine an internet service provider that ends up being run by people who actually don't believe in evolution and so they end up not delivering pages about evolution to, to school kids. So, so one, of the, one of the two things which is really, really, really important about this internet is that when you connect, you can connect to where, whatever, you know, whatever speed you've paid for, but to wherever you want. That the internet itself is not filtering. It, is, it may be gray glasses, it may, be white, it may look like white glasses, it, but it is not colored glasses. You are getting, when you look out there now, to a large extent, people's view of the world is, uh, is uh, what they see on the internet. So uh, you really don't want to people to be filtering what you can see. Uh, and the other thing you really, really don't want is that you, as you click, as you're, as you're a teenager wondering about whether maybe you're gay or one, maybe you've got a disease and you don't know whether it's a sexually transmitted disease and you certainly don't want to ask any person you know and you're going to go to the web, you don't want, as you are about to click on that really, really crucial or life-saving uh, click, you don't want to think that somebody is going to be recording the click, is going to be recording where you're going. They are going to be using deep packet inspection technology to build a profile of the house, and after you've clicked on that, the house will be branded as a house which is worried about sexually transmitted diseases. You will be getting all kinds of, the family will be getting all kinds of stuff through the mail that you wouldn't want to see in the mail, and the insurance premiums will go up, and uh, people will be possibly exposed to blackmail. So that not only do you need the way to be, to be able to click, you need to be able to click 
with complete privacy so that you don't want to be spied on. Okay, so net neutrality, the neutral net. We must fight for neutral net, and we must also fight against spying. And if you find that a government tells you that they really, really, really must spy in case uh, in order to be able to fight terrorism, then you have to go and ask them exactly what they've set up in the way of checks and balances and who is going to spy on the spiers because they'd better be good because uh, that data, the data about who's doing what on the internet is just a godlike view onto what's happening in the nation and in the world, which is uh, much too dangerous to treat with anything with, with, with extreme care. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to uh, thank Sir Tim uh, for his uh, presentation. And now we're going to take some questions. And uh, we can take them via back channel and or in person. If you raise your hand, we have people with microphones who can come by and, uh, OK. So over here. Thank you. I'm June Klein, Technology Marketing Ventures. Uh, I'd like to know what you think the internet policy implications are of WikiLeaks and um, uh, Arab Spring. Do you think that it's going to uh, have a reaction of more of an internet kill, uh, a kill switch, or it's going to make the um, internet's role even bigger? Well, certainly, it's certainly true that it's certainly true that the more people abuse the internet, the more governments will uh, need to and be, have an excuse to uh, try to take control of it. But looking, is, so there's actually the, the words, the sort of the words you use then bring up a whole bunch of issues and I'm just gonna address some of them. One of the things which you, uh, which it brings up is uh, anonymity. One, so there are, there are some fundamental rights people have out there like you know, the right to privacy, uh, the, right, uh, the right to free speech, and so on. Um, and sometimes these rights are in actually contradiction of each other. So one of the rights that you have is the right to know who it is saying, say, is saying something nasty about you. So for example, when, there are lots of places where anonymity is just actually not really uh, appropriate. For example, if you come to WCC, you join a working group, uh, uh, then you have to, uh, you, you probably, quite often you're working for a company, quite often you're working for a company which has got products involved or, and, and you say who you're working for. And you put, it, you put it on the table and you say what your interest is. And if you also, if you're working for two companies in fact, you actually put that on the table if you're, uh, as a consultant so that people know where you're coming from. And if within the working group you're really mean to somebody, there's a lot of people that are going to lean on you and t uh, in the bar before the next session and tell you that that sort of uh, behavior isn't appropriate. Because, yeah, so that yeah. there, there, there are all kinds of social systems which rely on yeah. people having well-defined identity. Meanwhile, if you talk to anybody who's involved in supporting um, activists under oppressive regimes, they will tell you that the desperate, desperate need is for anonymity. That these people, there are, pe there are many people that we've seen recently uh, during the recent events in the Middle East uh, that who will actually go out there uh, without anonymity and say to, and raise the flag as to, the red flag as to what's going on and many of them have been killed, injured and, uh, and tortured. Um, there are a lot, obviously, if there are systems which allow anonymity. It was interesting, I gather, that uh, the guy who worked for Google in Egypt and started, who's, I'm terrible at names, and started the Facebook page, which pe many people point to as the initial uh, seed of the Egyptian revolution, that when he actually, that Facebook took down the groups he was starting because they were started by somebody without a well-defined identity, and, that, and on Facebook, you can't do that. And so it's interesting. To, so now if you talk to somebody from Amnesty International and, uh, and somebody from Facebook, you'll get these two points of view. So the message is there's no simple answer to the question you just asked. Particular, and, a, and a great sort of example case is anonymity. Anonymity, you have at all times the right to know who it is that's, that's talking to you and the right to be anonymous. But the right to be anonymous, actually, we only need in dire circumstances under an oppressive regime. Uh, but because 
you don't know when the next, which regime is going to be oppressive, then you have to give people the mechanisms of blowing whistles under any regime. And we just have to have social constructs maybe involving courts, which will eventually judge as to whether, in fact, you're, yes, you, you, know, you used anonymity. You, 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 pulled the, you played this major, really high-value card. And, uh, but if you abused it, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, if actually you used your anonymity to launder a whole bunch of money uh, for, for, uh, from, drug, uh, from drug smuggling, no, you lose. The, you, we, we use the high power to take away that anonymity. So there's a very tricky balance. We need to de develop some really interesting social institutions in order to answer those questions in actually specific cases. We need to think everybody about these issues, about, which, you know, about where, to what extent, where we're going to put that line between anonymity and accountability. Okay, we have a back channel question here, which I'll do next. And the question is from Nick Gall, and the question is, how does net neutrality apply to search results? Much has been made recently about filter bubbles, and he has a link to a Wikipedia article about that. Uh, the tailing of, tailoring of search results by Google, Bing, et cetera, to the searcher. Should that be regulated? Well, um, this, is, this is another whole bunch of, of actually connected things. So uh, I think so. the filter bubble phenomenon was, uh, if I, I think that noun is applied to the idea that a search engine can get to know you, and so it can get to know the sorts of things it thinks you're interested in. And so you will end up in a bubble because it will, uh, you will reward the search engine, you will go to the search engine which feeds you things which you're excited about and happy about, and it won't feed you things which get you thinking. It won't. <laughs> okay, it will allow you bubble. No, nothing will burst that bubble. And so as a result, you will end up being dedicated to your tribe, you will never understand, as a Yankee, why the Red Sox really were so chuffed to, bit, you know, to, beat, the, to, to beat you a couple of years ago. Uh, you'll, as, a, uh, as an Israeli, you'll never understand why you're upsetting the Palestinian the people, the Palestinians a few yards from you, and so on. Uh, so the, uh, there's danger in the filter bubble also that you just simply, uh, you know, as a voter, have a strange view. There's also dangers in filter bubbles that you can, once you've been bracketed as somebody who buys pretty expensive stuff that the, the, the web won't show you the, um, uh, the, the, the cheap stuff and so you won't believe that the cheap stuff exists uh, and so you'll have a just twisted view of the world. So that, that whole, that, uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting thing. Um, somebody mentioned the Web Science Trust. Uh, one of the, uh, that sort of discussion is very much what I call a web science issue. We have to when you actually, if you look at that sort of thing, you really have to look at the humanity connected as a very large system, and you have to use a lot of different, you have to use uh, sociology, you have to use psychology, you have to use economics, and you have to use mathematics of all sorts, as well as computer science to figure out uh, the web and, uh, dis and figure out what the, the implications of that will be. So I would say, good question, good web science question, go become a web scientist, go study uh, all the relevant disciplines, find a, find a uh, university where they're putting web science on, openly on the curriculum, uh, and then you will be able to answer, maybe do some mathematics to answer questions like that. Um, and you always have, a, uh, uh, of course, a choice in the uh, search engine, even though you may not think so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when you ask a question, if you could just identify yourself and over here. Uh, Abdullah Ustansel from Brook College, City University of New York. I have two uh, unrelated questions. Uh, the first one is on the status of the semantic web, uh, what has been achieved and what do you expect uh, uh, that will be achieved in the future? And my second question is, is there such a uh, thing, a concept as uh, the responsible use of internet? Of course, it is too uh, broad. I would specifically uh, restrict it to the children and teenagers. As, is there a concept of a responsible user internet. of the internet? Um, okay, I'll do the first one uh, at length, perhaps. So, so the semantic web is, is the web of data. It's 
Uh, I think it's uh, exciting because I think people understand the web of documents and they don't, and don't realize how much buried potential there is in data. One of the cool things about the city of New York is that when you go there, you can not only learn f from the mayor how excited he is that you're living in New York and how excited he thinks the future is in New York, you can actually see the, you can pull down a CSV file, so you can compare the number of potholes around your street, you know, there's, well, I'm not sure about it. I imagine, the, uh, you know, but that's sort of, you know, typically the sort of thing you'd expect with a city, and I guess she's nodding. You can pull down the CSV file to look at the number of potholes to find out whether, in fact, your street has actually got more potholes than anybody else's street for the same socioeconomic uh, level in A, the city, B, other cities. Uh, it's, so data on the... So uh, semantic web is basically about data on the web. There is... Uh, there is the, the, sort of the highest value form of it is, is called linked data. That's when you put data on the web such that when data is about a particular street, for example, it's given that the concept of the street is given a URL so other people who are talking about the street uh, can link to it. And so that when you, as you end up pulling data from different sources, you get more and more, uh, you get richer and richer data. And that's actually when you start really discovering things, when you link the data together. In fact, if you thought, if you're into data, then you probably know that when you join data, it's, you know, that's the only, only interesting thing to do with data. Just looking at it is not interesting. There are web pages and documents and poems which it's nice to just look at. Right? You don't have to link between them to, uh, to, to get a full out of them. It's kind of cool to link between them, but when you link data together, then suddenly you discover things which you'd never discovered before. And you build businesses which you'd never built before. So the web data out there, it's uh, doubling about every 10 months at the last count. Um, it's there is the, uh, a recent phenomenon is that a standards can, there are various standards for putting out uh, linked data. There's RDF, there's a, uh, an informal standard called Turtle that a lot of people like. Uh, there's huge amounts of that out there. Um, there is a query protocol, remote query protocol called Sparkle, that's uh, with a QL at the end. Um, and those are, are out there, but recently there's a version of it called RDF slash A, RDF A. And the RDF A is a, uh, is a relatively recent in linked data terms standard for uh, putting data inside your web page so that when you've got a web page on a product, um, then a machine can pull the data about that product. So a machine can then compare products across not only your website but other websites. If you go to something like Best Buy, for example, every product in Best Buy has got uh, RDF A data. So there's... Um, and so the RDFA data out there is, uh, is expanding very rapidly, and it's part of the linked data cloud. Um, there's a recent initiative from the search engine, big search engine companies, uh, Google, Bing, and Yahoo, uh, called schema.org, where they have said, look, we think it's actually it's re it's really useful for you to put data about, when, uh, about uh, in your, to annotate your web page. Uh, and they've produced a, their own suggested vocabulary you use for, th for things like price and weight and quite a lot more complicated things and you know, saying this is a flat screen TV. Um, uh, and they are se and then, that, that, then what happens when you put the data on there and the search engine picks it up, that instead of getting just a little snippet of text from the page, the search engine could say, can give you actually a little product box and give you, uh, and allow you to pull, not, not just look at all the pages which are about the products, but actually allow you to look at the products and compare the different washing machines for what their top spin speed is, for example, because top spin speed is in there as data on the web page uh, without, having, without the search engine trying to re, you know, understand the English on the web page. It's, so, that that's, so that's all happening through RDFA. There are, uh, uh, in fact, there are two formats, both in W3C at the same time, which probably have, will have to get rationalized, one called microdata and one called RDFA. And they're basically an identical, uh, very, very similar, they have very, very similar syntaxes. Um, so it's, yeah, it's very exciting, it's all go. And, uh, the, uh, and uh, if there's a sort of company near you, you know, or a government near you, and their data isn't on the web, you need to go around and have a little talk to them, because otherwise they'll miss the boat. Uh, okay, over here. Um. Oh, the second question oh, is: there, Is there such a thing as good web users? Well, so many user, people, human, so many human beings are web users now. The last question is: Is there? Is there uh, 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 it's like saying, is there an appropriate behavior for a human being? And um, that's a long... Hmm? 
Is there appropriate behavior? For, I think I'm not going to discuss that one because it's, uh, we'd have to talk for quite a long time to find out what exactly you meant by the question. Um, and uh, so maybe we should do it offline afterwards. And you really not, you're cheating if you ask two disconnected questions. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Paul Mendra and I'm a tech entrepreneur. My question is, uh, I think of the internet as literally the new country. Uh, this is the internet century and America is Europe. Uh, the internet is America. My question is, which of you team and vent is Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> the internet is a new country, you say. I, uh, I think I'd point out that the internet isn't a new country. No, but a lot of people initially, when, 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 the, when they first met the internet, they thought it was. And they had the idea of you know, cyberspace as being you know, the, the, the new frontier, the new pioneer frontier with no, with no laws. They were wrong because everybody who's on the internet is also in a country and everybody who's doing something on the internet. So I think it's kind of so one of the things I've tried to actually, uh, but um, uh, tried to point out to people is that, you know, if you're doing something fraudulent on the internet, you're doing something fraudulent. <laughs> and so you'll go to jail, real jail, you know, in the real world. <laughs> and so, uh, so I'm loath to describe it as a new girl. But uh, Vin, do you want to? Uh, to reflect on the... On the uh... That's an adequate response, Tim. I'll, I'll wait and remember I have an opportunity. Okay, there you go. Vince, uh, for every question you ask, Vince is storing up two or three answers. He's going to come back a little bit. <laughs> okay, we have a, a person uh, in back there. Yeah. Wow, this is amazing. Tim Berners-Lee, uh, great to meet you. Uh, I'm, my name is Sean Keen, full disclosure. I uh, work in a New York City uh, for-profit startup that's using uh, New York City public data mine. Um, to wire up digital networks on street addresses, and also founding a uh, not-for-profit uh, called General United uh, that is uh, trying to mainstream link data and uh, create new protocols that everyone can use. Yeah. So three parts to comment on really quick, though. Um, the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative um, for Transparency is. If you're familiar with that. The Icelandic. Icelandic Modern Media Initiative uh, okay, is an initiative to create a data transparency haven in Iceland mm -hmm. um, and to hopefully propagate that to other countries. Um, okay, that's one part one. Uh, okay. Net neutrality with things like uh, distributed peer-to-peer -peer networks like Diaspora for um, Facebook mm -hmm. social network, alternative um, BitTorrent and Bitcoin, um, just, and uh, the availability of new uh, generic top-level domains from ICANN. Um, how did those blend into the internet that, that you would want? Uh, they are a conference they? of them. Each one is a conference of its own, but let me pick one. Uh, and, sort of, and, and, and in that general area, one of the themes running through that was robustness. And certainly one of the things I'm really interested in <clears throat> is a big uh, hike to the robustness of the web. <clears throat> and so uh, I think a bunch of us have been worried about this sort of in back rooms for a long time. And, but a lot, a lot of other people out there thought that the web was like sort of uh, the, the rain and the internet was like the air it fell through. And um, you know, occasionally there'd be a stop break in the rain, but basically you could rely on it coming, coming again. And then when the internet was turned off in Egypt, suddenly people so realized, wait a moment, no, so what can happen? So everybody, you know, read Tim Wu's book, The, uh, the, uh, the Master Switch. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of people started wondering who's going to turn it off. Is it going to be um, a big company? Is it going to be a big government? Uh, but the other question also you have to ask is, is, are we going to, is it going to be more like the New York power outage? Are we going to build an internet which actually hums really well, but we've messed up? We've, they, we've actually haven't done the mathematics about things prop pr propagate, and there's a, there is an unseen tipping point around the corner. After that tipping point, one tweet could bring the net down just because of the way the auto-tweeters have been set up and how the way people fall back onto, you know, automa or the, way to, the way the auto-bloggers tweet when the, uh, blog automatically when the, num when the amount of uh, tweets go above a certain level and so on. So, have, you know, are we building a stable system? So there's, uh, so there's, there's corporate or, uh, or government in interference in the places where you can distinguish between them. Um, he said cynically, uh, and there is failure due to, uh, if, if you like, an accidental design flaw. Um, we 
I would really like us to think a lot and actually do stuff and change protocols uh, to make the web more resilient. I would like it, for example. Um, so my favorite idea is that when, I'm, uh, when I click on a link from web page, website A to website B, uh, and the browser just gets the timeout from website B. It doesn't get a 404. It just gets the timeout. As though there's, there's something wrong at the internet level and it can't tell anything else. It goes back to website A. It, it knows it's got the referrer field. It knows where it came from. It goes back to website A and it says, hey, you got a link to B. Know anything about it? You know, what's going on here? Uh, and the responsible website A will keep a list, maybe, of things like uh, the checksum of things that it linked to, or maybe a complete copy to one level down of everything it's linked to. Or maybe, in fact, A will say, well, actually, I'm, I'm a member of the Northeast Universities or the, or the uh, uh, Chemistry Universities uh, Mutual Aid Group, uh, and B is too. So you can go to anywhere, any one of us. In fact, you can hash, use this hash table, hash algorithm, to find out who among the, the, this group of, chemis, of chemistry libraries will have the article. You've, you've, and you'll, and there should be at least three copies of it, uh, one on each continent. So, um, for example, uh, to not, no, to, so building the, the system so that, so that HTTP starts to morph into a peer-to-peer -peer protocol seamlessly and seamlessly so that you don't have to install anything special. So that it comes in your default web browser so you don't get put in prison for installing anti-government software. You just get the latest, latest update of each, uh, of each browser. Yeah, I think it would be ne uh, as necessary also, um, we have to also think about uh, um, uh, making it more responsive for uh, disaster response. I mean, New York did a huge amount of data after 9-11, immediately after 9-11, in a panic, I saw some great talks, people who were doing, putting together geospatial systems just to figure out everything they could about New York in three dimensions. Uh, so now that stuff exists. If uh, another disaster, something just unexpected, uh, say a tornado, hits New York, then, we'll, uh, then who will be able to get at that? Will there be multiple copies? Does everybody know where it is? Do the people, who, you know, if the wrong office is completely taken out, does, you know, how, does, how do people bootstrap themselves? I think that I, there's an interesting comment uh, in the Times article by John Markov uh, interviewing the Egyptian ISP who realized that Egypt was intact but had been cut off. And he thought, ha ha, we can use IRC. I've always wanted to get back to using IRC. So all, we, all I have to do is to set up an IRC server down. I don't have one inside the country. They're all in America. So I can't install my IRC, so I can't set up it. So we can't bootstrap ourselves out of this. So yeah, making robustness is a really big, uh, big thing. And I encourage you to think about it and, and do about it. OK, over here. Um Pulses, and uh, we're working to humanize the internet through um, psycholinguistics and um, psychology and, and economics and mathematics, as you mentioned. And I was just wondering if maybe you had any comments or if I could pick your brain on humanizing the internet and standardizing the internet through sort of the idea of human inter interactions rather than logical keywording and so on, turning it into thoughts and so human what, emotions. What, so what's so humanizing you mean things like Treating everything that you do so much as a human interaction. And so including the, the, the uh, not just the uh, factual content, but the emotional co channel as well, that sort of thing? Correct, yeah. That's not very just, interesting. Not just users, but businesses and entities and um, events and um, so on. Okay, I, well, I don't know lots about what you're doing, and, uh, but, it sounds, uh, but you've, got, um, you've got your company m uh, mentioned in the Q&A. And so, so, so certainly there's a, uh, sorry, I'm teasing. Uh, the, um, certainly, uh, I, I mean, I, people tweeted with, with, with surprise about the fact that WTC is, has got standards for emote icons. Uh, but on the other hand, a lot of people figure that actually if you do standardize, uh, if you can take, if, if you look at the emotional, uh, the, the standard emotions that we come with, that we seem to have them in common with people of all different uh, nationalities. They're not, not language-linked. We also have them in common with dogs. 
so that they, you know, they seem to have, we seem to have, they seem to have been frozen out fairly uh, a while ago in, evo in, in evolution before we, uh, uh, b b before we developed uh, complex language. Um, so, okay, disclaimer: I'm not a, uh, I'm not an expert in all this, but it all seems very interesting. So, uh, so for example, um, uh, understanding how people react emotionally and being able to pick out of their act uh, of their tweeting the emotional pieces and then being able to track that back is really interesting. I think that I think that actually I'm also interested in the neural science, which is going on to understand how people behave uh, <clears throat> and tend to react. Uh, Rapidly and in, uh, uh, and sometimes uh, uh, against their better judgment, rather rapidly. F fascinating result I heard recently that you can put somebody in an fMRI and you can see a racist response triggered within a very short number, number of milliseconds, and in a non-racist you see an overwhelming suppressing result from a much more higher level higher level part of the brain. But in a racist, that just isn't there. And there's sort of Nate Silver's result where he said that people, the people who couldn't imagine a black person as a president were, had a huge overlap with the people who had just never lived or worked with anybody of a different race. So, that's, so the understanding how people operate in that area may guide us to build systems where, for example, there is a little timeout. So that if before we actually respond at video game speed to somebody coming around the corner, uh, intellectually or physically, then or physically in a virtual world, uh, that we actually, build, you know, can we build systems which are actually allow us to be, allow the thinking part, allow the non-racist bit to click in, and allow us to, kind of, so I'm, this connects to a very large area uh, of development, which I'd like you all to get involved in, it's a great place for startups too, uh, is areas, uh, is building, uh, building systems, collaborative systems on the net which allow us to do our democracy, do our science, figure out what to believe, figure out who to trust, to build meritocracies, to build uh, and to, to supplement and maybe later even improve on the current systems we have like peer review and, you know, uh, and review of experiments to figure out what to believe science-wise and the current systems we have for democracy. You know, maybe you know, we've got the system, fairly old system, developed when you know, people ride around on horses uh, for how we, do, how we elect people to run the country. Um, now we have a, a system which even breaks down country borders. How can we build, you know, imagine uh, uh, a, different, a, a different topology of a democracy? Let's, uh, it's great to see different websites experimenting with different forms of democracy. Maybe some of them will find really nice systems which are very pro-human, very you know, allow to preserve a lot of respect and allow us to come to conclusions without all the nastiness. Which we, which we otherwise t tend to be, find, to find natural. Okay. All right, we're, we're running a, a minute or two behind now, and I'd like to take one more question. I have one from Jolly McPhee here, which goes back a little ways uh, to some other things we were discussing. Uh, how much does the rise of unrestricted managed services, quote unquote, in the mobile arena threaten the open internet? Is the distinction clear in the public mind? You are, okay, all right, you were, um, oh, okay, oh, his name's at the bottom, okay, right, oh, yes, I see. Um, I think, so I've defined what I mean by net neutrality, right, so when I buy internet, um, the, that uh, if you've connected with a given speed and I've connected with a given speed, then we can talk to each other using no matter what, pro what application is a given speed well, with a given quality of service. So um, managed services, there are all kinds of things there where <laughs> which fall between a completely com proprietary system where uh, like table, cable TV, where you, you have a, a wire and it gives you just TV. Um, and the internet which has been tweaked a little bit so that in fact your TV from particular places has been optimized. And in fact, good network management involves doing lots of very complicated things. And uh, so um, I think Vint may uh, address this also. Um, I think it's really important for the uh, ISP community to be able to figure out how to distribute the funding between each other in a fair fashion so that all the f funding which is fed in at the edge, you know, appropriate amounts of it are given to uh, get to the ISPs, which is a very, really, really difficult uh, uh, s s problem to solve anyway. Um, but 
the constraint on that. And so managed services, uh, I sort of actually, the, 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 idea, or the idea that if you give me an, uh, an internet which is particularly tuned for getting uh, video from a particular supplier is, uh, will, mean, will be a fantastic deal because it'll allow you to invest so much more uh, and, uh, it'll, uh, and it'll allow me uh, to, to get it so much cheaper uh, and stuff. I think it's a, it's a dangerous argument. Um, and uh, I think whenever you say, people say, Basically, um, whenever you see a large company say, unless we, more, unless we screw the consumer, we just won't be able to put in the investment that this really, really needs to be able to, to get internet to every last person on the planet. You know, and uh, I, 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 that, uh, I think, is not an argument that I would listen to for a moment. And at the end of the day, uh, when it comes to making internet neutral, it may be that you can imagine a non-neutral internet which would actually be cheaper. Uh, well, in fact, if you give complete control of your life to a company, they'll probably actually not charge you for it at all but give it to you in a cornflakes box. So, um, so yeah, you know, that's, but you, so we, are not, we will end up paying for the, for the right to be able to connect with anybody. The, you know, the, but the neutral internet is worth paying for. And the whole idea that, oh, no, 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 we can't do it for a reasonable price, is unreasonable when the prices are falling so much, when, when so much, when uh, as fiber goes in, um, as, te uh, as wireless technology gets more efficient, uh, then prices have fallen. Do people think that they won't fall anymore? That would be kind of odd to imagine that we've had this onrush of te technology s over the you know since the steam age, and it's now going to stop. So I think uh, so I think that if if when you're drawing that balance between what is a what's a reasonable managed service and what is a, in the open internet, I say that you should always err on the side of making sure that the net is neutral because it's more than just uh, trying to balance the economics. It's fundamental. It is a fundamental need of a democratic society and a democratic world. Okay, let's let's thank Tim.